call this uh, meeting of the Rocky Mouse City Council, more specifically the Committee of the Whole, to order. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone here today. Um, as many of you know, uh, this is a working session of the Rocky Mount City Council. It operates kind of like a committee in which we discuss in a lot more detail many of the matters that we're addressing. Uh, it doesn't function the way a normal city council meeting functions in the sense that there's not a, a public petition part of, it, of this agenda, but uh, simply a working session. We have a number of items on this uh, agenda for today. Uh, part of the reason that we uh, advanced the start time from 5 o'clock until 4 o'clock. And uh, the first several items, which are real estate and attorney-client privilege related, uh, call for a closed session. And in the closed session, that means that uh, only city council members and pertinent staff remain. So at this time, I would ask for a motion to go into closed session to address the real estate and attorney client privilege matters. So moved. Is there a second? Any discussion? If not all in favor, say aye. Aye. All of you are welcome to stay in the building, but uh, we'll, we'll close the door here and we'll open it up when we go back into the session. Thank you for being here. We are back in back in open session, and um, we've got a, several more agenda items here for the open session. We will need to go back into a closed session around six o'clock, or maybe a few minutes after. So just to let everybody know our process here this afternoon. So I recognize the manager. Thank you, sir. Um, this evening we are very happy to budget manager to present to council and the public the proposed plan 2024 five-year uh, capital improvement program. Uh, this is an opportunity, it's the first time we've seen it, for you to receive the information and there will be subsequent meetings for further discussion. So I'm going to turn it over to the council and ask you what Thank you very much and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, we are prepared to present with you our 2020-2024 uh, uh, proposed capital improvement program for this upcoming five-year period. We do this as an annual update of our capital needs, and uh, this is just an overview of what we will discuss today, and I will be mindful of the uh, time constraints of the, um, that the Councilman Rodgers brought forth in terms of talking about. I do want to start off with discussing some of our current year projects. Uh, three projects we just want to note uh, that are perhaps of significance. As you know, when we presented the CIP last year, when we presented our budget for the current fiscal year, we talked about the importance of roof repairs. So we've got several structures that are in need of some roof work, and I just want to point out uh, the roof work over at the Judicial Center is, almost, I think it's pretty much done at this point, and that project uh, was started earlier this spring and is complete. And this project, this picture which I took from the roof of the police department last week is over looking at the senior center and you can see that they are doing the roofing there at the senior center right now so that project is currently underway so both of those roofs will be done in the current fiscal year and then we of course the cip have planning to then do the roof for the south Rocky Mountain gymnasium and then following that the imperial center so our four largest roofing needs right now should be done by the end of fiscal year 2021 or so with the south Rocky Mountain next year and then the imperial center after that we also, uh, another item just to show you, this is our newest fire apparatus, another fire engine that we purchased this current fiscal year. And uh, that is, this is currently still uh, at the manufacturer, but it should be delivered here very soon. Uh, so we are in the process of having that also taken care of a project we funded this year that also should be delivered before the end of this fiscal year. Other projects we have going on, we do have a street resurfacing contract, uh, and, and, and that should be, you should start seeing more action uh, here with the arrival of the later spring. Uh, we are continuing to work on the improvements on the first and second floor. The first floor, of course, dealing with the uh, one-stop shop facilities for development services. The runway replacement program uh, at Rocky Mountain Wilson Airport, our contribution to that is being funded this current year, and uh, that project is underway. And what's great was originally we had grant funding there for both runway work as well as some additional improvements, including the T-hangers. They were able to get grant money to cover the full cost. So the cost to us are actually a little less than what we were originally anticipated with that project. Uh, ongoing IT system enhancements. This current fiscal year, we're doing some renovations to the Manhattan building component of the Douglas Block. This is a 
work that we're doing throughout the buildings at the Douglas Block uh, as we've taken ownership to address some issues that need to be taken care of with their ongoing restoration. And then also the driver's area in the former restaurant space at the bus station um, to, to make that available as a permanent driver's, uh, driver's facility. Uh, police vehicle replacements as well as improvements uh, to their pistol and rifle range as well as the establishment of some tactical training uh, facilities uh, to help with uh, their development and training and pre preparedness in law enforcement operations. Uh, we received money from the Golden Leaf Foundation for improvements to the boat ramp at Sunset Park, and that project is ongoing. Uh, we have scheduled in the CIP uh, money for the expansion of our internal use uh, landfill for handling construction and demolition debris that's located at the wastewater treatment plant. We have money also in there for sidewalk improvements that includes the annual program we use that we get assistance from the federal government through the CMAC uh, Congestion Mitigation Air Quality Funds as well as the Safe Route to Schools funds, which I believe that's for Williford Elementary. Is that for Williford? I believe. Um, but the Safe Route to Schools funding. And then last, um, also the widening of the, um, also some additional funds that we have to have, not only for sidewalk, but for utility relocation associated with all the various NCDOT projects that we have going on, road construction, uh, including Hunter's, Hunter, Hunter Hill, uh, and then you also see in, in the coming five-year period, we also have funding set aside for the work on Wesleyan as well as some other, some other roadways that are being improved. Last, these are some other projects that are listed. I'll, I'll hold off on uh, going through the list, but you can see the, most of these have to do with utility operations and, and have uh, to do with projects that we have ongoing uh, that are in the current year's capital budget are being, uh, that were appropriated this current year and are being and are ongoing. With respect to our proposed CIP, we are proposing over the next five years a CIP of about $183 million uh, in, some of, in terms of the projects that we have identified, and about 43 of that is programmed in fiscal year 2020. Now, this is across all government operations, not just general, general government, but also our utility operations, water, sewer, gas, electric, I'm sorry, water, sewer, gas, electric, and stormwater operations, as well as transit, so there's, there's a lot of different operations. What is the minimum threshold to qualify for CIP? Fifty thousand dollars. So any so the projects that you name prior to the spring are projects that are already underway mm -hmm. in this fiscal year. This fiscal year. Yes. Okay. And they are greater than fifty thousand. Right. 50, 000. The project value is greater than fifty thousand. So it may be less than fifty thousand this year, but the total value of the project is greater than fifty thousand. And this is just a breakdown of the expenditures by year. And as you can see, we have uh, the next two years, and I'll, and a lot. The reason why those numbers are higher is because of some of the work we have in sewer. There's uh, some some work, and and again, as we continue to refine the CIP, those numbers may change. And, and ch these, are in, a lot, in some cases, with the work in water and sewer, as well as, as in stormwater, are more of the largest case scenario responses. Obviously, we only we want to do the right thing in those projects, and we're trying to do our best to. Um, minimize cost as necessary, which of course leads to those to the cost going down in, in future years. Um, getting into, as you'll see here, the largest area of expense is in water resources. That's about fifty million dollars. So combined water and sewer projects are over fifty million. Next, when you look at energy resources over the four-year period of time, almost forty million dollars. That's electric and gas, and that's pretty normal for them. Uh, service transportation, which includes the money we received for the power bill allocation, around twenty million dollars. And then we get into the general government operations, about 17 and a half for parks, 16 for stormwater, which is another utility, then 9 million for fire, a lot of equipment replacements as well as some facility work. Um, then our facilities, including, and that includes a lot of funding we'll show with respect to City Hall and some of the improvements we need to make here uh, in this building. Additional funding for public works, a lot of that's tied up in equipment as well. Police, along with facilities, the replacement of our, our annual patrol vehicle replacement program. Um, IT and communications and then transit and Douglas Block. Uh, in terms of the funding, and this is predominantly in a large case for a lot of these utility projects, but also for some of our general government, given the size of these projects, we do use installment debt. And this $44 million with respect to the general government portion of it, we have structured it so that its structure is such that it's still consistent with our funding plans with respect to what the, what the financial advisors have recommended. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. But we have structured this in terms, particularly in regards to general government, also looking at our utilities to make sure within those lot guidelines that are set by our financial advisor. Enterprise fund at 37.5, that's current 
money over that five year period of time. General fund about 16 million, and as you can see, the other resources is going down the line from, for revenues. Looking at the projects themselves that we plan to engage in over the next five years, um, from a facilities perspective, uh, perhaps our, our, some of our bigger projects involved here at City Hall, first of all, the elevator replacements. In the coming year, and you will see this in the proposed budget, we plan to replace all three elevators in this building. So the two elevators that are part of the City Hall side and also the elevator that's in the Police Department side, uh, those three elevators will be replaced in the next two years. So that is a, that's a major uh, improvement that we need to take on here pretty quickly. Uh, we also have uh, some additional work, and this is to continue the work on the first and second floors. Uh, we've, start, we've started some of that work, in, particularly in design, and in, as we're going through this, there's a need to bring some facilities up to code as we, when you start doing renovation work, particularly with a building that's over, that's almost 40 years old at this point. It, there's a lot of things that kind of get caught up into it, so it, it kind of makes you real aware, and we've been working very hard as a, as a team to try to figure out what we need to do and try to realize, and then provide the best information on that. Same is true with respect to the Judicial Center. There's a restoration of their elevator, which also needs work, as well as the fact that this past year, our uh, Building Maintenance Division and Finance Department did a, fa a facility condition assessment and identified some structural issues that need to be addressed. And so there's money, you'll see that there's money in the coming budget for that, as well as for some uh, work with respect to the judges' areas uh, of that facility. Improvements at the warehouse, again, another elevator. Uh, we really, we're really trying to do our best to address all these elevator issues at this time. Uh, the cooling tower at the, at the train station, obviously this is a building that we have our own facilities as well as other tenants, and the cooling tower is very important with respect to the HVAC needs of, of, of the building. Um, complex lighting and parking improvements, this includes uh, in the next couple of years repaving the parking lots out here, which I don't believe have been replaced since the building opened, as well as doing some other improvements. Uh, property management facility. Currently, property management is still in the Weaver building, and our intentions is in this next couple of years is to move them out of the Weaver building into another location, um, and so that we can and also decommission the Weaver building and probably tear it down because it does need to be. Uh, it, is, it is a space that we eventually need to, to open up, and then also our ongoing facility maintenance, and that includes maintenance at the Douglas Block um, that we have ongoing. From a technology perspective. Um, we are obviously waiting um, to really kind of provide more uh, provide more on this in this area with respect to once we bring on our chief technology officer. So where while we do have funding in the CIP for not only just general technology projects but also for some specific technology investments for given departments, really as we move forward, those those funds and those allocations will really kind of be more centralized and we centrally manage with respect to the role that the chief technology officer will play in the organization moving forward. And that also, that also includes our communications operations, our radio and telephone systems. I talked about with the Douglas Block, this past year we completed a, the financial, the facility condition analyses of the various buildings uh, that are part of the Douglas Block complex, which allowed us, uh, allowed Mike Vaughn and his team to put together a prioritized approach for building repairs uh, that are going to be ongoing over the next couple of years. And then once that's done, then it's basically going into continuing the maintenance of the facilities that's our responsibility as the owner of those properties. On the police and fire side, uh, the most noticeable expense is an ongoing annual expense involves the replacements of our vehicles. We've replaced about 12 patrol vehicles a year. We're gonna, you're gonna see an increase in uh, vehicle and patrol vehicle replacements because the auto manufacturers, as you know, are going, the typical auto manufacturers that we use for our patrol vehicles are going away from sedans. They're getting out of the sedan business, basically, which means that the interceptor models and the patrol models are now pretty much going to be exclusively SUVs. Uh, we have kind of held off on going in that direction. Some other jurisdictions have gone in that direction of going ahead and replacing patrol vehicles with SUVs. We're now going to have to start doing that. And the reason why we held off was because it was cheaper to buy sedans than SUVs. Um, so we are now going to have to move into a position of having to purchase SUVs, and that, of course, increases the per unit cost for the purchase of, the, of that equipment. So that's something that we are aware of and that we're going to have to work with. Um, also, we have set aside funding uh, in the coming fiscal year for the acquisition of property uh, for an evidence and property management facility. And this, again, is to, um, to properly manage and maintain for accreditation standards, evidence, as well as other properties that are held by the police department. 
Uh, also, funding is in the budget this year for a storage building for our reservoir police boat. Uh, this is to have it on site at, the, at, at there and in a, in a controlled facility to maintain the to maintain the condition of the boat, as well as improvements to our fire stations. And then, long term, uh, continuing to work with the realignment of fire stations two and three, which will involve property acquisition and development of sites. But uh, our long term plan with respect to those buildings, with respect to those stations, is to realign them. Yes. Is that because of shifting demographic population within the city? Correct. It, it deals a lot with the fact that once the annexation, I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, you with just respect, put a human, Ken. We had that. I understand, but um, I appreciate it. But the um, the those stations when we annex when we did the annexations around 2008-2009, uh, we had a. Uh, we had planned, of course, to build an eighth station. That was part of the plan. And then when certain annexations got pulled back through through, through legislative action, that put us in a position where our where our station alignment was was, was unbalanced. And so uh, we are still uh, still actually still in service contracts with at least one volunteer fire company to make sure that we are meeting our minute standards, even though we pretty much provide all the service. It's still to make sure we're able to maintain that ISO two rating. This will address it. I mean, uh, Station 2 is our busiest station. And it's also, I think, to also look at the reality that that station is also one of our oldest stations. And with the idea of, of moving them into a modern facility, they're kind of in a very tight space, not exactly the most conducive space to the operation of a fire station it being on a street, free, right at a high traffic corner, putting it somewhere that makes more sense. And then also, the other challenge with Station 3 is Station 3, part of its coverage area is restricted, is, is challenged because of its location and proximity to a rail line, to, to the Nash County Railroad. And so obviously if there's a train running it and there was a call on the other side of the tracks, there could be a potential problem. So it's to move both of those stations into locations that are more conducive to operations to ensure proper quality of coverage. Going to Parks and Recreation. Uh, the upcoming with some significant projects we have going forward is uh, the redevelopment of Battle Park and there is funding in the budget for uh, the preparation of a master plan for the redevelopment uh, for a community to have uh, such a wonderful rural, a wonderful woodland space in an urban environment is, is a pretty significant asset that we need to do our best to work on redeveloping as well as addressing improvements that we need to make in the Battleboro community uh, to kind of help them as well uh, looking at various improvements we need to make there and renovation, ongoing renovations to our neighborhood parks. We have taken on some significant renovations in recent years and we need to continue to do that. Uh, as I said before, we have roof replacements this coming year is South Rocky Mountain Community Center Gymnasium and in the following year is the Imperial Center. We also have funding uh, in the budget for senior center renovations as well as, I'm sorry, in the future for senior center renovations as well as a variety of projects that involve a lot of ongoing improvements from Sunset, from small improvements at Sunset Park to other facilities throughout, including MLK Park and other facilities. On the public work side, this is the kind of the end of the general government part, uh, facility improvements to both our fleet maintenance and environmental service facilities, these are ongoing improvements that we need to make to both of those facilities, as well as equipment replacements for streets and environmental services and continuing to address rollout cart replacements. We still want to try to do as best we can to, to, to make sure that everybody is using the same carts and to replace uh, some of those older carts that we still have in service. Uh, service transportation, we, of course, uh, were very fortunate because of the uh, decision we made several years back to implement a, a, an increased vehicle fee that we can do an annual resurfacing contract of significance, and we are, we are planning to move, continue with that. Uh, there was, there's, there's money in there for pavement condition survey in the coming years. Ongoing work with pedestrian improvements as well as corridor enhancements, particularly here in the central city. Um, supporting ongoing roadway maintenance programs. A lot of our funding in Powell Mill goes to support ongoing maintenance uh, directly as well as to support that work that's done in the general fund for the streets division as well as in stormwater operations. And then also some other areas including a si uh, inventory of our regulatory signage. Uh, there's a lot of compliance work that we need to do to make sure that we're, uh, that we're doing what we're supposed to do to ensure uh, driver safety and passenger safety. Going out to energy resources, this is our, these are our electric and gas utilities. The most significant project that they have is the underground relocation of downtown overhead utilities. Uh, it's a significant project over the next couple of years, and that project would start next year. Uh, we did, of course, significant undergrounding along Main Street as part of the Streetscape project several years back. 
this would be to continue to expand that undergrounding to other parts of, of, of downtown, uh, which is pretty consistent with where you, with other cities that you go to. Pretty much, they're they're all they're, they're, their work is underground. Also, uh, poll inventory. This is something that's done about every three to five years. Uh, it's a pretty standard compliance measure. Transformer replacement at substation 10. When I started here, uh, it's been now 12 and a half years ago when I started here, uh, we were doing a lot of work with upgrading our substations. Many of them had not been upgraded since they had been built in the 1950s, 1960s, or early 70s. And so we had a lot of trans station, trans, trans substation projects. And if you look at the CIP, you'll notice many of those projects are not there anymore. We've, we're kind of getting into the short rows, including a trans, transformer replacement as well as a transmission line on 14. Uh, and again, some of these are about to provide redundancies and to provide, it, to provide loop connectivity to ensure quality of service. Distribution system improvements, equipment replacement, and then on the gas side, uh, also continuing to provide funding for gas operations, maintenance of mains, extension of mains, as well as uh, they have an engineering assessment that is scheduled for funding this coming year. On the water resources side, perhaps the largest and most significant project is the beach branch outfall. And in the CIP, this is a considerably high-funded project. However, uh, our Water Resources Division, Brent and Brent um, and his staff are doing their best uh, to try to identify where the need is and to make sure that the project is right-sized with respect to making sure that the integrity of the, of, of the outfall can be restored in, a, in, a, in an efficient and effective fashion. So even though we have budgeted from the standpoint of basically a full replacement, our goal is to hopefully bring in something that's more appropriate, uh, in particular, and more and more uh, more in line with our available resources. Another thing, uh, particularly on water resources, that is affecting us for both water lines and sewer lines, the impact of these widening and utility relocations. And with respect to this, obviously, this is something we know that's coming down the line as work goes along on the 301 corridor and other corridors where DOT is doing work, particularly widening work. Uh, we are responsible for reimbursing DOT for utility relocations. It used to be that we had basically a three-year payment program with DOT, and now they require payment in one year. So when they give you a bill, they don't give you three years to pay, they give you one year to pay. So that means we have to budget that money basically in one year chunks, and it's a more significant expense. Ongoing replacements to our water lines, replacing old uh, galvanized steel lines with, with, with modern lines, uh, ongoing improvements to our treatment plants, both for water treatment and wastewater treatment, improvements to our sewer pump stations and lift stations. Um, the kind of now going into the next phase of our tank painting and maintenance program, where pretty soon we will have done the, the first phase of making sure that all of our water tanks have gone to that first initial repainting and maintenance that we did as part of this program, this annual program, and now going more into that cycle aspect of maintenance to make sure they uh, maintain, that they're maintaining well shape as well as the continued implementation of the asset management plan uh, that we've been working on in water resources. Lastly, with respect to stormwater, um, downtown drainage improvements, I know that y'all uh, have been uh, talking about that. Uh, this is a four phase project and the first phase, the design phase, that phase one starts next fiscal year. So when you see the budget, uh, see it in the CIP and also see it in the uh, proposed budget, you'll see that, that that program is underway. As well as work also, uh, predominantly uh, looking at Parker's Canal, Maple Creek, and Winders Creek, as well as ongoing smaller improvements throughout our stormwater, our stormwater drainage system throughout the city. The other thing we wanted to also just mention quickly is that we do have some unmet needs. Obviously, we, we understand that we, when we put the CIP together, that we are constricted with respect to available funding resources. So we have to, we have to right size the CIP in order to be able uh, to present it to you in a, in a manner that where we believe we can actually achieve what we're proposing. But there are a couple of areas that I do want to mention that when you see, as you're kind of looking at it project to project, you may notice some of them are more of an unmet need, which means we have it scheduled, but we don't necessarily know how we want to pay for it. And one is probably the, the most significant one is really equipment replacements in the general fund. And this is everything from, uh, this, this includes a lot of rolling stock vehicles. Um, and basically that, that financing limit that we put on ourselves of, of when it comes to installment debt, which is around $2.5 million per year on average, that's really the limitation that we have that we have, to, uh, that we have to abide by. And so that kind of limits our capacity with respect to, to, funding, uh, to funding these replacements. And then another project we have, and this deals with the utilities, and it's in the CIP, but we're still kind of trying to evaluate, and we'll be doing some work this coming year, 
to try to really see what the best path going forward and whether or not really that this is something we want to move forward on has to do with upgrading our utility system meters. Our, our AMR technology, which we have in place for all of our water, I'm sorry, all of our electric and gas meters, the radio read system, and for a good number of our water meters, is really now kind of old fashioned. And now they're moving to a modern technology. The challenge is that we've got to make sure that if we move and we migrate into these technologies at this point, that we're really going to see a return on investment. Uh, that's a lot of money to put out. Uh, a project like this could be over $10 million to do all of our meters. It could be well over $10 million to do all of our meters. And so it's really something where all of our utility staffs are working together to see what's really the best path going forward. Is I mean, they understand that this is an older technology, uh, but it, was, it does, it, it, it definitely works in a lot of ways. It has some challenges in some ways. But the real question is, does it make sense going to the next step at this time? Or is it something more that we may need to wait a while kind of see where, where technology is going and perhaps hope that maybe, as, as, I, as I like to say, I don't like paying for things at the R&D level. I prefer to pay them at the retail level or the wholesale level than when we can. And so that's an area that uh, we see some potential benefits, but the question really is, do the benefits, do the benefits <coughs> balance or outweigh the cost? So that's really all I have uh, with respect to CIP and wanting to kind of do it in a time-effective manner. And I'll, if there are any questions. Or... <coughs> Any questions? That will come after we have a time to absorb it. Okay. And we've certainly got several budget meetings scheduled, so there will certainly be more questions and comments. So thank you, Kim. Thank you. Mr. Mayor Hotel, I think we might be ready to go into back into the school session for personnel. Okay. You, you're looking at the mayor? I'm looking at the mayor and I'll. Okay. All right, well, now, unless you want to take a quick break before now. How long do you think the uh, next item will take? Uh, should we? Probably about what, 10, 15, 10, 5, 10 minutes. Why don't that? we proceed with that one? Okay. Though, and to and kind of disrupt, case. keep the flow going okay. a little bit. Right. Okay. Well, we have to go this, this really is um, for council's information that I asked them for um, any action on the part of the council at this time. But we do have a uh, situation that is um, brewing in our community, and I thought it important to bring it to your attention and uh, give the staff an opportunity to discuss it with you and also to share with you what the next steps will be in, in addressing. So no, no action needed. Why did I get this together? This is a uh, presentation or a program really that was supported by both uh, Development Services uh, Inspections Division as well as the Police Department. This is a joint program that they're Thank you. It looks like we're ready. Um, just give you a little background on some of, some of the issues that we've seen here. Um, in 2016, the internet cafes in the city of Rocky Mountain, that use uh, was removed as a permitted land use in our uh, land development code, also known as the LDC. Um, and what, what's happening now is people are applying for uses that are permitted in the land development code. However, once zoning, police, fire, inspections goes through, uh, in, in a lot of these cases that certificate of occupancy is issued, they're operating outside of the use that was listed in that permit application. Uh, and we believe the majority of these are centered around um, internet sweepstakes and um, some photos here of some places that we've been. Uh, and we've compiled a list of, looks like about over 20 potential properties that we believe are in violation of that issued CO for that use that they applied for at the time. We've got a map here. Uh, generally, you see some of those that we know that are open and operating, some of those that are pending, and those pending would be, we, we've sort of figured out what they come in and apply for. We'll see some uh, uh, electrical permits, and there'll be a lot of stations around the wall, but we cannot deny an electrical permit as long as it meets the building code. So we get to a certain level, um, and we see and a majority of them are just, you know, typically in the commercial corridors. So it really has no effect on, you know, 
regardless of where they're located in the wards, it, it's, it's generally the, uh, the you know, commercial corridors throughout the city limits. And these are the types of uses that when they, when they go in and look, some of them will try and expand the use, and this is sort of what uh, zoning officers and other people go in and see when they come in. So they're coming in, uh, a lot of uses will say they want to be a copy center or a smoke shop, a vape shop, uh, used clothing, some things. So when we go to do the inspections, none of this stuff is in there. So they may have copy machines along the wall. They may have clothing that comes from a, a unit next door. A lot of these are upfits, so it's not new construction, new development. They're upfits, and they, and they are turning over. Um, I might hand it over to the chief or his crew here. Good afternoon, everyone. Chief Robinson. Well, first of all, as the police department, we investigate gambling on a weekly basis. As you can see, gambling is any person or organization that operates a game of chance or any person that plays or bets on any game of chance in which any money, property, or other thing of value is there. So we investigate gamblers. That's normal. Um, I brought with you tonight Sergeant Edmonds, who's in charge of my investigators, special operations investigator. And what we do, we compile a gambling investigation. We make sure it's thoroughly investigated. And we present that information to the district attorney's office. The district attorney's office will be able to evaluate what we've learned and what we investigate and decide whether or not we need to proceed with um, charges to go forward with the case. So as this relates to internet switch state machines, I brought Sergeant Hammonds, who's in charge of those accounts operations, and he will go over those particular um, machines. Good afternoon, um, city management, city leaders, um, members of council, and guests. Uh, my name is Sergeant Jay Edmonds with the Rocky Mountain Police Department. Um, I've been tasked with, me and my, me and my work group has been tasked with uh, investigating complaints of illegal gambling and illegal sweepstakes operations that either come from community complaints, members of our community calling and advising of these locations, or um, locations that have been identified by our inspections department. And the main thing I wanted to just present to you, more so than anything, is what the statute says because that's what me and my work group are going to investigate. It's not going to be personal opinion or anything like that. It's based off of violations of the law. So I provided you with a couple of different copies um, of some statutes that are pertinent. Um, 14292, North Carolina General Statute 14292, primarily deals with the actual gambling law, the broad gambling law in the state of North Carolina. And how that pertains to different machines that you might see out in the community that statute actually um, pertains to what's commonly referred to as stand-ups or pot of gold machines that you may be seeing that may be operating in some uh, back rooms of um, small gas station type establishments and things like that. When it comes to the electronic sweepstakes, that's the statute 14306.4 that I provided in the handout this way. And it does state that section B Notwithstanding any other provision of this part, it shall be unlawful for any person to operate or place into operation an electronic machine or device to do either of the following. Conduct this sweepstakes through the use of entertaining display, including the entry process or the reveal of a provise, or, and or promote a sweepstakes that is conducted through the use of an entertaining display, including the entry process or the reveal prize. And it's important to note also that it is intended this section to prohibit, any, prohibit any mechanism that seeks to avoid application of this section to the use of any subterfuge, pretext, or whatsoever. So, the, the, the statute itself is rather wordy. It is a long statute. But to basically break down the 14306.4 statute, it defines an electronic machine as a mechanically, electronically, or electronically operate device that is intended to be used by sweepstakes interest that uses energy and is capable of displaying information on the screen. And then the entertainment display is even broken down in the statute as well and defined as visual information capable of being seen by an entrant that takes the form of simulated, uh, actual or simulated gameplay. So there's a couple of things that you may be hearing um, when it comes to these types of investigations. I just want to take the time to be able to address some of these. And most of them are on the form of frequently asked questions. So the first frequently asked question that we get all the time is, 
is there a legal slot or game in machine? And the answer to that is yes. It is defined in the statute, uh, North Carolina General Statute 14306, subsection B2, which is in the handout that I also gave you for your reference. The next question that we get often is, is there a legal video poker machine? And again, the answer to that is yes, there is. And that is defined also in North Carolina General Statute 14306 1A. I don't want to get into the long details of it. That's why I provided it to you in the handout so as to be uh, um, in the time, so as to be timely. Are fish tables legal? The answer, you would need to refer to North Carolina General Statute 14306. That particular statute outlines what the state of North Carolina deems to be a legal gaming machine. Okay? Um, specifically for that particular gameplay, merchandise with a value of $10 or more and the interchange of conversion of any merchandise to money would be a violation of that statute. So, now, is there a legal sweepstakes? Yes, there are legal sweepstakes. However, they've got to meet the statutory requirements of 14306.4 that I just provided to you in the handout that meets the definitions that we just read and went over. There has to be a promotional offer. It has to have a start date and an end date. It has to have odds available, and it must offer customers free gameplay. That's basically the statutory requirements of the complaints that we're going to be looking into as we move forward with these investigations, looking for violations of those laws that I just um, explained to you. So, so does that mean you, you would shut some of these down? Or basically, with that. The law or is it fine? Right, so what we're looking for is we're investigating the complaints as we receive the complaints. And we're investigating each complaint based off of a violation of either one of those statutes, General Statute 14.292 or General Statute 14.306.4. Making sure that each individual complaint doesn't fall in lines of the 14.306 that defines legal gambling. But before the shutting down occurs, we're working forward and closely with our local district attorney's office because we've been advised that that's the most important detail. And communication with the 7th Judicial District and Attorney's Office, they've assured us that we bring them a good case and they will move forward with criminal charges on that case. Any other questions? No? And the reason you are taking this action is to prevent people from wasting their money on gambling or to um, prevent other kinds of crime from taking place in these operations. The main thing is the community complaints that we receive. We receive community complaints of people feeling like they've lost money. Uh, we've also received various of very violent crimes that have occurred at some of these establishments. Um, some of these establishments have been known to have robberies that have been reported and some robberies that have not been reported, which leads us to wonder why not. Um, more, more so, the violation of the law moving forward with that is making sure that there aren't violations of the law occurring and investigating those thoroughly. Yeah, so essentially our, our first step will be to uh, provide letters to those that are violating our land development code, give them a chance to cure that, maybe get back to the original use on that CO, and if not, it's the next step would be uh, police intervention and action. You have a copy of the memo? Uh, we got to get that straightened out in your package. So, 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 the community stores that they got to have, those stores get those permits, or how do you get those permits? Is that like a gas station or a convenience store or something like that? Or just a community store. Here. Yeah, and some of those, it, those aren't as full blown as some of the other you know, photos we've seen, so they may have a, a machine or two or something. Those are the other ones that we listed on there. Um, that we need a little bit more um, action on to see, you know, what exactly is that. But there are some that we know that are full blown. They get in there, they get the CO, they block out the windows, they uh, lock access to individuals so it's not a, a free entry. You maybe you have to have your ID and uh, do some other things to get in there. So not as open as it should be. So our first step will just be to look at all those, send them that letter that we've got in there, um, see if they come into compliance with our LDC at that point and then we'll, we'll go on to phase two and, and further on. Other questions? Thank you very much.
think at this time we now need to go to the personnel. So I ask for a motion to go into closed session. Any discussion? Not all in favor say aye. we're able to evaluate a, work, a written agreement that was developed between uh, the city and Rocky Mountain Edgecombe CDC, uh, along with the intent to implement monitoring uh, requirements and criteria in the schedule. Uh, we evaluated the home policies and procedures that were developed. We looked at their site review procedures. We looked at environmental uh, policies and procedures. And we also looked at the home uh, builder rehabilitation uh, agreements that will be used in the future going forward. Uh, we also looked at what they've implemented to track uh, the HUD program activity uh, items, and we looked at the current relationship with HUD. And what we really found is it's good news. We've made a lot of um, positive progress with HUD and with all the things that have been uh, reported in this monitoring review. Uh, we did look at the spreadsheet that they're using currently to track the activities, we found that all the criteria needed in order to stay on top of the different programs and activities has been implemented into this spreadsheet. The spreadsheet is a temporary measure and people actually, they're in the process of implementing a project management module within uh, MUNIS to be able to track, the, track this in more detail and, and have a much more robust system. Yes. Is that a module that other cities have used, or is that something that's been developed because we have decisions? If other cities are using. Mm -hmm. We also identified the um, two expenses that had, or two um, funds that had to be reimbursed. One dealt with a HUD finding number four, where we had lack of evidence of an environmental review that had been performed at 807 Elm Street, and that amount had to be returned in the amount of $47,000. A second amount had related to HUD concern number two, where there was a new home construction project that did not get the um, home buyer agreement uh, properly executed. And we went back several times to, to those home buyers trying to get them to execute that agreement. But since the material had not been presented at closing, uh, they refused to sign that agreement. Uh, the CBD department went ahead and refunded, that was $130,000, went ahead and refunded that. We just found out last week that those funds were actually returned to us. We did not have to reimburse that amount because it was a concern and not a finding. So um, while we did report in, in the report that you received, $450,000 over the last six years of HUD funds that had to be returned. Re recent development just came out since we had already published the report to you that 130 of that was returned to us. So a little bit better story in that regard. Well, we've got a written copy of this. That you're it's, in your, it's in your It's in your not So overall, past six years, 450000 had to be repaid, but bringing that down, we're closer to 331000 that had to be repaid. Um, a lot of that, they, HUD would say, was due to staff turnover and inadequacy of, of administering the HUD programs. If they actually um, stay on top of the programs and the policies and procedures and, and tracking that they have developed, you know, we're optimistic that we're not going to be in this same predicament going forward. In talking with the HUD representative, he was very complimentary about the current uh, CBD staff and their level of knowledge about the requirements of these programs and administering this, and their level of collaboration with HUD to make sure that they were getting the right things in place um, and, and their commitment to doing things in the right way. So overall, positive report, but again, I'm going to limit the scope. All we looked at was as it related to the HUD monitoring review from 2018 for the period of 2015. Any other questions? <coughs> Anybody? I'm done. Okay, I mean, that, I think that's what we wanted to find out. Um, where, where, where that's what I wanted when I asked you to do that, was to find out where we were and where, where, where our uh, relationship with HUD was at this point. And, and I, again, the representative that we talked to was very um, positive, very favorable. I think he had participated in the last two HUD uh, monitoring reviews and said that the team that's in place right now um, demonstrated a, a solid commitment and he had a lot of confidence in going forward and, and had favorable things to say about the relationship with Rocky Mountain. And so for the record, again, 
there's a report made for some time in 2015 for funds that was corrected by staff in 2018. Correct. Okay, so the current the staff. The, most the current staff okay. was correct for the prior errors that occurred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there was something in there that uh, he didn't have a, a, a written agreement with uh, it was Rocky Mountain, Rocky Mountain mm -hmm. CDC or it had lapsed or something. I think their, their status had changed from the Chodo to a developer and the agreement had not been updated to modify that change. And so I think they've exec executed a proper agreement at this point in time and implemented monitoring procedures that was also another re recommendation from the HUD report. And I think the first one of those took place maybe last week. So they're they're continuing to move forward, set expectations, and and created a schedule and a calendar in order to make sure that that happens. Did uh, HUD representatives that you spoke with have any concerns about um, potential areas that we need to look for, or are they focused on the? fact that they have a staff that they feel is competent that they can work with. The one thing they said is that there's a lot of work to be done and they don't know that they're properly staffed to get that work done. So I think that that's some of the, the things, you know, going through the budgetary process right now, do we have the right skill sets and do we have the right staff to, con to make sure that all of this uh, continues to move in the positive direction? Yeah. And I know that they put a lot on the compliance officer that was just implemented She's a part-time person. They think that person needs to be full-time. There's a lot of responsibilities on her plate, and so we want to make sure that um, we're right-sizing her, her level of effort and that we've got the right person enrolled to be able to do that going forward. Did they find, so I just want to rehearse again, hear again from you, that the staff that we have in place is competent yes. and capable? Yes. And knowledgeable? Knowledgeable, competent, and capable, and committed. They felt, they felt very positive. I mean, he used the word confidence that the current staff would be able to, if they manage this the right way, he, he felt like they had the capabilities to manage this for us not to get in a predicament like we were in the past. The compliance officer that's part-time, is that because she's, she or he is part-time with the city or because they share, to have two different job responsibilities? Part-time with the city. I think it was someone who was in the department years before. I think she had retired and I think they, she came back out of retirement. I think her initial desire was to work part-time, but I think at this point she said she would go into a full-time role if necessary. But is that an area, because it sounds like part of our issue is turnover. <clears throat> Do we need to cross-train people in order that somebody leaves that we don't have uh, people up there that we know what they're doing? They are cross-training. They brought in um, a head consultant and have done like a series of different courses for them. I know that they brought in um, a couple other groups to, to help train and so and they're documenting everything and so I, I think that they're headed in the right direction. I think they've made a commitment to doing that. Okay. Lori, do they, does HUD provide us any kind of periodic report or feedback in terms of are they are they concerned or worried about anything? Is there any, anything that's kind of automatic in that I'm, nature? Do you know about that, Paul? I'm not sure. Okay. No, I, I, not that I'm aware of that, but you know. They did say that one of the triggers for this monitoring um, review was turnover in staff. If you have significant turnover in staff, then that's a, a trigger that goes up. Um, but I don't know if they give you periodic kind of reporting, this is what we're concerned with. They talked about going further back, do we have any indication of any other in-depth search visit? We didn't look at anything prior, other than what the scope of this review, so I, I'm not in a position to answer that, yeah. Okay. And we still probably have a couple of years of exposure where these policies and procedures were not in place, and so I, one of the big things is lack of documentation. So they'll do the environmental review, but they didn't document and they couldn't evidence, you know, the environmental review. So if we still have some of, you know, that lack of documentation, lack of um, attention to detail, we might have some areas of risk, um, but we're just not aware of any of it. So we can look at that before they do look at it. So. Certainly we could. 
given what you've said about the, the turnover and the, uh, the training that's required and the expertise that's there, and Rochelle, I don't really know how to ask this, but um, it would seem like some kind of periodic report from you to give us assurance that everything's in good shape, that you're satisfied with it, uh, that things are in good shape would, would be helpful. Uh, I don't know if it's quarterly or semi-annually or something, just to give us an assurance. Because it, it does seem like it's something that uh, maybe has not been given as much attention in the past as, as, it, as it appears to be given, be, being given now. Before you go to the next time, if you don't mind, would you mention this? I'm happy to. Yes. Hi, Carbone is my senior auditor. She was working for the city, um, and I recruited her out. Uh, she's a payroll supervisor in our accounting department and has decided to join forces with me and has been actually knee deep in the event center and helping me with investigations on the hotline and everything else. So she did the ground running. Again. The name again. Paula Carbone. Paula Carbone. Thank you. So the next item for me was to talk, just to give you kind of an overview of what I need with an, auto, an automated audit management system. And what I'm recommending is a, a product called Teammate. And what it does is really integrate everything from a risk assessment process to my automated work papers to, to report writing to findings, a central repository for all the findings. It handles scheduling, um, timing and expense reporting. But it, it, it's just a comprehensive tool to allow us to do everything uh, consistently and integratedly. Uh, right now, what we're doing is creating for the event center. I, I, I probably got work papers that that <laughs> that deep, and and that's probably an, an underestimate. It, this allows you to put everything in. You've got your audit work paper. You can cross-reference to all your supporting um, audit documentation, your audit evidence. You can then you know kind of cross-reference that to what your findings are where your reports are you can start to do trending analysis to see where we have um, commonality and different things you know across multiple different audits so it just gives you a way to manage things in a much more efficient effective way and and allows us to be a lot more um, prudent with our time because right now what we're doing is very very time consuming Any questions on that we already approved that described were things like the arts, family entertainment, family fun, things of that nature. We also had obviously sports, sports tourism, other things we had included business and industry. So what we came up with were what you have in your hand. This is the branding style guide. We have produced training on this with 
folks here in the city, different departments, different areas. But one of our big things you're about to see, and we are excited, I just got to tell you, we have a couple of jingles that we have produced. All of you, what you're about to see has been produced locally. The jingles are already airing. They are airing on 95.5. Make sure I get it right. Power 95.5 here in Rocky Mount. Choice 92 here in Rocky Mount and in Raleigh. And starting today, 101 KISS FM, 101.9 KISS FM, which is a 100,000 watt station out of Greenville that handles Greenville, Jackson, and Newburgh. So we've really started getting this message out. Starting in June, our, um, our, wow, my brain just, just butts. Mm -hmm. Starting in June, our jingle, the, not just the jingles, but the uh, commercials will start playing. And they're going to play on WRAL along with our air here at City Rocky Mountain. Now, in addition to the five, we have five 30-second spots. Those are for broadcast. That's what you will see on uh, <coughs> WRAL. In addition to that, we are on Suddenly and on our air for the two at the end of this, which are our event promo. So I'm going to step out of the way. I will tell you that local, when I say it's produced locally, the jingles, the pop, you're going to hear a pop version by a gentleman named Ronald Edge Productions here, here locally. We also have the hip-hop version, which is by Stacy Young Productions. Most of the video that was shot for the, uh, for the commercials was shot by Studio L Productions, edited and produced in-house by our own staff. So, I'm going to step out of the way. It would be Robin. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I appreciate that. I will say that without Jesse, we wouldn't have the jingles because he actually put us in line with both of our artists. You guys are going to, I hope you like this as much as we do. We have your lot. Yes, ma'am. On page 13, there are those acceptable and unacceptable. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. And I see that one's light and one's dark and that kind of thing. Is there a rationale there? Is there a specific one? Well, okay, let's see. Second row down, the left, first two in that row. Um, the two with the blue sky? Right. One has the white. Yes, ma'am, because the darker one shows up better against that white. Chances are if you so didn't have the clouds in the all background, all the white would be fine if you didn't have the clouds, but that cloud. Those clouds kind of take away from the logo. So that's so all that's we go with criteria and all of them. The difference. The one that's most legible. And yes, ma'am. Because if you, if you can't read it, then you don't know what it is. So the goal is to make sure you can see it. That's why we're picky on how we want it done. All right? Thank you. Obviously the first was more of a pop crossover and the second was the hip hop 
Uh, Mark is getting ready. The seven videos will all be played in a row. There is a very, very short break in between each video. Each video is 30 seconds. Uh, we will be doing, we are also in process of a, of a country style jingle as well. And then Jazz, some foods. So we can all this. Yes, sir. Yeah, we thought about that for a second. So then ask the question. <laughs> Event Center downtown. They have been tournaments, and I'm hoping that the tournaments will continue to grow and get larger. We already have a sports complex, softball, baseball, soccer combination, and now you bring in basketball and volleyball. We just continue to get better and better. This has been an athletic town. Seeing is believing. If you see it, then you can dream. When it comes to sports, Rocky Mount is at the center of it all. Rocky Mountain is a very vibrant and invigorated city. It gives us an anchor point for everything else that goes on. From the Rocky Mountain Mills all the way to the event center, Rocky Mountain is definitely a city on the verge of change. The energy just exudes out of here. This is a city that's at the center of it all. Mount is the place to be. It has a small town vibe with the big town benefits without the big town problems. We have the arts. We have wonderful restaurants. We have wonderful venues. Just a little ways from now, we're going to see some real exciting things happen here. Strategically located, Rocky Mount is truly the center of it all. from making pottery to art to painting classes, just so much to do here. The planetarium and everything here, the Children's Museum, the First Fridays, we're really excited. The list goes on and on. Whether it's entertainment or groceries or a drugstore or, or work, just to have it right here close to home in the center of it all. Employment, it's a fun, it's everything that you need as a family and for your family is right here in Rocky Mount. There's lots of free or low price things to do in Rocky Mount. All of the parks and recreation. I love going to the park. From good times with friends, <laughs> things to do on the weekends, along with great activities to enjoy in the community. Rocky Mount's the center of it all. The City of Rocky Mount hosts Downtown Life. The Summer Music Concert Series is back and happening every other Thursday, May 23rd through September 12th on the Imperial Center Lawn. Come out for groups like the Legacy Motown Review, The Tams, Jim Quick and Coastline, Chairman of the Board, and more. Doors open at 5 p.m. Music starts at 6. Admission is free. For more info, visit downtownrockymount.com. Thanks to the following sponsors. The City of Rocky Mount hosts the Juneteenth Community Empowerment Festival, May 31st and June 1st at the Imperial Center in Rocky Mount. Learn about Juneteenth, an annual festival commemorating the announcement of the emancipation of slavery. Also, enjoy music from the We Are One Tribute Band, an AV honor roll celebration, and a performance from R&B recording artist Vivian Green. It's Vivian Green Live. Admission is free. For more info, visit downtownrockymount.com. The pops, the little black slots, were is a cable issue, according to Mark, because those do not have any black pops in them like that. You have where it goes to black briefly. So, how do you like it? Yeah. Just so you know, that is part. That is what we are doing to get the word out about the positive things that are going on in this city. Yeah, we get a copy sent directly to that lady that said Rocky Mount's on the demise. Don't understand. them in the gallery. But so we did. We did want to share with you what we were doing and, and how it was going. 
Yes, sir. So, question. Yes, sir. Um, this is just a technical issue, which I don't know. I'm not sure. That little scratch at the beginning of the hip hop. Is that contemporary? Do they still scratch? Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. I'll be honest. Okay. I'm not the one to ask that. I'll let those who are better with this one. That gentleman's talking about 30, some of his 30, some of his 30. But so we are, and again, this has a broad reach. It's not just reaching one group. This has a very broad reach. So we hope you enjoy it. And in front of you, as you see, you all have goodie bags. Uh, that's some of the new branding that we have put out, and it, we are going to. You'll see some of these at different events. There's a really cool fan. And the little small thing that is in there is actually for your car. It goes on your key ring. It is a USB charger for your car. It lights up when you put it in. But there's a bunch of things in there. So enjoy. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Um, when do these say or are they already airing? The commercials start airing. The main, the first five will start airing in June <coughs> on WRL. We are already airing the Downtown Live commercial and Juneteenth uh, on uh, our air. And they will be airing on Suddenlink um, as well. Uh, various networks on well, they, Suddenlink. We have links on the website, so we can yes, sir. We will have transfer. It, it'll all be on social media as well, Facebook and Twitter and um, uh, YouTube. YouTube as well. Thank you. You're Outstanding. Welcome. Okay, no, I think we do have one more agenda item. We will oh, so boards, and boards and commissions. And so, Pam, you handed out something earlier. Um, the first thing that you see is the Board of Education Board of Education Board of I do. Uh, for the workforce housing, I'd like to uh, uh, point uh, Jim Martin. And I don't have his history form with me. I'm, he's got the blank. He's, I'm expecting in human relations. There is not a vacancy there, but 
she sent it in, so I included it. Um, the library board, Daryl Terry has been serving on that board. He, his appointment actually expired in December, but he has been continuing to serve. Um, I have his attendance information included in that. Um, he would like to continue like to, <coughs> to serve. And then there is also another young lady who would like to be appointed in that position, um, whose personal history form is attached there as well. So I don't know if you want to ponder that. Without objection, she's no point. I encourage Pam to keep writing this every committee the whole day yeah. until we get this done. somebody else that knows somebody who would call a vet or call somebody that, you, that might be able to tell you somebody that would be good serving on this board. But, um, I'd like to see if we can't go ahead and get that one up and running. We've been working on it for a long time. So um, if you've got somebody to know, then maybe call a vet or somebody that gets somebody to serve them. Like that would be you find your way. Left me a message this morning, and she's already turned in the committee thing. So, any 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 other appointments tonight? Have you used? Working on it. Well, you know, we, we don't have to wait till the next committee at the whole meeting. I mean, let's call Pam and let's we can approve them at the next council meeting. Yes. Yes. So, I was going to say, well, so we, 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 we want to not do it out of a meeting. So, we want to be careful. Yeah, I know. I, I, I was aware <laughs> of that. We, we want to approve the form. Okay. Any other appointments tonight? If not, uh, yeah, go ahead. I have one question that I want to ask Jeff Rose, our city attorney, our mayor, David Cohn, our city manager, Rochelle Smalltown, and this entire council. Because I felt that I was threatened tonight. And the mayor did not call this gentleman out of order. So I want to know tonight. With this lynch mob coming down here and these people attacking, I'm not afraid, I'm not intimidated. But I don't think I should have to sit there and be threatened mm -hmm. by people every council meeting. And you have to gavel and don't call people out of order. 
Well, well let me, I'm, can I finish? So I want to know from you, Jeff Rose, if people continue to attack certain council members and have uproars in the, in the chamber, what is the protocol? If the mayor can't handle the audience, what is the protocol? Because I want to be in line. Because if it happens again, something needs to happen. Well, the mayor, the mayor can use his gavel. If he doesn't use his gavel, what do this council have the authority yeah, to this do? This council, or one or more council members can make a point of order. If they point of order the presiding officer, at that point, he will be required to take some action. So we hear that, right? Yeah. So if it happens again, the mayor doesn't use the, the gavel to call the person out of order. How many council members? Well, just one, but if you have more than one, it, it, it lends more support to it. So when we say... Point of order. Point of order. Point of order, Mr. Mayor. Point of order. And then and that's what? That's a signal to authorize him to use the gavel and, and ultimately to uh, ultimately to, 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 to evict the man from the, from the council. Because I'm saying it because this is serious. People are killing folks. People are going to school shooting. And with this temperament and this environment, we should not take this lightly. Right. Now, if it was the other way around, I'm being serious, not playing the race card, but it would not be tolerated. Now, I want justice for my life and for the rest of the council members. Because if it was other managers and other mayors before us, when we're having people coming here protesting for justice, they had police wrapped around this bill. I don't feel we have the same coverage. And I've been saying it for the last two years. And something has to be done. And this is serious. I mean, who want to be in a body bag for serving their community? I don't take this as a joke. I'm not afraid, but I'm not going to sit there and continue to be attacked and people sit silently and not say anything and force me to say something and then I look like the bad guy when we got policies and procedures and we got the law on our side. It's not fair. So from this point on, y'all can call me whatever you want to, but I'm not going to take it. You can excuse, you can escort me out of here and call the law, but I'm not going to take it no more. Because they have three minutes to speak, that's our rule. And the council can speak or not. So that's what I want to say. I got a question. There's people like that that we know that historically have done that. Is there a way to prevent those people from speaking to just a call on? Got the right to speak until they get out of order, but you, yeah, you can have the free speech rights. But the next time they come, if they they get out of order, you can you can have them removed from the meeting. There's a procedure you go through where you where you ask them to leave. You just Mr. X or Ms. Y, you disrupt the meeting. Please leave. If they don't, if they refuse to leave, that's when you can have them arrested. I definitely want to thank you, Andre, for bringing it up now. And, and, you know, and I think that, yes, it is pretty tough to have someone call your name out in a derogatory way. Right. And I, I just want to say, it's not just here. It's, in, it's an environment that's fomented mm -hmm. by the HIGTV and the trashy talk show in the mornings. It's, a, it, it's an undergirded by social media websites that put all kinds of things that are not true, allegations that are unsubstantiated and cruel and mean and unethical. And uh, Miss Manager, I wish you would start opening up your mouth mm -hmm. and addressing the lies mm -hmm. that are being spoken like you have no right to park in a spot reserved for military 
individuals <coughs> when your husband served in the military. Oh, yeah, military. And if they had good sense, they would have looked at the decal. But to me, it's problematic to have people following folk across town, taking pictures of you wherever you go. That's stalking. And, and people are rabid, and it is racist. I don't care if folk don't want to be called it. Stop acting it. If you don't want to be called racist, don't act racist. Don't say things that are racist. And it is unfair. And I'm not going to put up with it. I, I've said it again. I'm not putting up with words and actions and not calling it what it is. Just don't do it. If you want to be called it, don't do it. That's pretty simple. And it's not right to have a double standard of decorum when other people, just because they're not an elected official, can say what they want to say. And that's wrong. And it's immoral. And it's unethical. So I'm just saying the whole tenor of this whole piece about people not liking the environment, are feeding into it and making it up. Now, we just heard tonight a whole report that all these things that were reported are unsubstantiated, they can't track it down, it was from people that nobody around here knew and had nothing to do with it. So overall, Mayor, I'm sure you both have heard from several council members, including myself, about security, upgrading our security. It needs to happen now rather than later. Because it's been a few months that we've raised yes. that issue. Right. And it seems to be getting more and more intense. So it needs to, really needs to be addressed like, immediately. Well, I can, I can say that one of the first steps um, that you will see is an armed security guard that was built uh, during the normal working hours, as well as during council meetings. Uh, visitors to City Hall will have to check in, register in. They'll be given a visitor pass. Um, wherever they, are, they have business, that department will send a representative downstairs to greet their visitor and bring them upstairs to wherever it is that they're meeting. And when that meeting is over, over, uh, over they will return back down to I will also have um, one of the restrictions to the city manager's office suite restricted. The lady that came in and spoke today was very aggressive and actually I felt, felt threatened by her. That's why the police was called to escort her out of the office. These offices are private offices. City Hall is a public building, but our offices are private and no one has the right come in and take pictures and have a seat and do whatever all else in someone's office, especially mine. Um, then um, we are going to look at some of the other things that has been discussed at the staff level about how to secure uh, council chambers. One, of course, would potentially be wanting people as they come through that door to make sure that no one is bringing in uh, any weapons or anything of that magnitude. So we are focusing on um, how to make the building secure. This building, unfortunately, was built 40 years ago. It's just so open. It's very difficult to secure each and every access. But we're going to do the best we can to control access and to know where people are in the building. Um, it is um, a bit, bit haunting here late at night, I will tell you that because I don't really know who's in the building and who's not. Although the um, janitorial staff is pretty good about closing up and locking up, but you just don't know how people can get in and stay there, you know, until um, you look up and find something. Mm -hmm. um, so we are, we are working on a plan, and we can bring something back to you at the next meeting. I won't even wait until the committee will hold me, but the next meeting plans are to try to do what we can. Well, I 
I suppose this plan would be developed in conjunction with the police department and there some is, security, some security professionals. There, there is a team of people mm -hmm. who have been working on this for quite some time, mm -hmm. and they are represented by police, uh, fire as well, inspections, mm -hmm. some of the cold issues. So there's, there's a team of employees who are working on property management. So can I law enforcement officers who pretty much guard the door of the council chambers, that they from are they from private companies that are not our employees? They they are our employees. And they're also um, people who are not in the So they so they're not they, 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 when they sense something like tonight, it seems that they should somehow become more visible or but they can't say anything unless the mayor say something. Right, well they're 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 really looking for direction mm -hmm. from the mayor and I guess to some extent, you know, by promotion to them become closer or to engage the individual. Mm -hmm. And there have been some occasions when I have done that. You've seen them mm -hmm. kind of advance closer right. to the podium. I would like to see more of that when they when people become when they start women I would like to see the more visual. Well the mayor asked in the opening introduction to the session that you can't do personal attacks, uh -huh. you can't call people names out that address the city council mm -hmm. as a whole, mm -hmm. not as individuals. And those are the guidelines that we expect people to go by when they're not going by those guidelines and think that if we don't call them at that point, the next person is going to think that. Mm -hmm. so, and people have the right to criticize. I'm not talking yeah. about I mean, people got the right to criticize. Mm -hmm. But nobody has the right to impose threats yes. and intimidation on other people. That's incorrect. Mm -hmm. It's incorrect. Yeah. I don't know it would not be tolerated if it was in that Nash County building or in, in, in other places that I've been. Just the appearance of um, someone even talking loud, you would be, you know, taken out. But I'm just saying, I don't have a problem with people calling names, you know, uh, Councilman Knight, Councilman uh, yeah. Washington, and so forth and so on. But no, not no threat you know, But, you know, yeah. You know, so. So my last question, Madam Manager, is do we have a timetable as to when some type of security can be implemented? Or well, as, as I was saying, the, the issue downstairs, I'm told, will be implemented in um, short order. Chief Robinson is, is working on that project. Mm -hmm. Others, you know, will take a little <coughs> time because uh, it is to the building, mm -hmm. that's something. So, trust me, it, it is definitely the priority uh, because not only is it security for myself, but it's also security for my, my employees. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we were just fortunate that it wasn't any worse than what it could have been. And that's really for all over the, the um, building. So it's not just the city manager. <coughs> that's what every mm -hmm. every department, every office in this building is very vulnerable. It's very open to things, bad things happen. So we've got to fix that. Anything else? Yeah.